Hi, I'm Carl Herzog, public historian for the USS Constitution Museum. Beginning in 1803, with her appearance in the Barbary Wars, USS Constitution was a regular presence in the Mediterranean. And during much of that time, she was making stops in the port of Malta, in the port of Valletta on the island of Malta. Malta was strategically situated in the Mediterranean, being less than 200 miles from the North African coast. And so for the Barbary War, as well as in numerous squadrons uh, over the course of the 1820s through the 1850s, USS Constitution was a regular presence in Malta. In fact, at several points over the course of her career coming in and out of Malta, more than two dozen sailors, likely of Maltese origins, were enlisted as members of the U.S. Navy and served on board USS Constitution. A few years ago, the Naval Order of the United States began contemplating a memorial to celebrate this in Valletta, Malta, and led by Lieutenant Commander Michael Zampello, uh, this actually ended up occurring. Um, Mike, could you uh, introduce yourself and tell us how you got involved with the Naval Order? Sure. Thanks, Carl. Uh, so uh, currently I'm serving a uh, Navy reservist, and I'm currently serving at headquarters with the Defense Attaché Service, which is our our, our naval diplomats, our military diplomats that maintain the relationships with uh, counterparts and foreign militaries. Um, I was uh, supporting our defense attache office in Valletta, Malta uh, a few years ago. And uh, I happened to uh, be just uh, literally uh, standing with the then um, uh, naval attache, uh, Commander Carlos Plazas, standing overlooking the Grand Harbor and we were discussing his efforts to, you know, uh, grow relationships between Malta and the United States, uh, as as is, you know, what that's basically what what he's there for. Um, and uh, during that period, um, uh, I mean, Malta, uh, you mentioned a, a strategic significance. Then it still has that strategic significance, being uh, basically right in the center of the Med. So you know, every, all the traffic uh, uh, on the on the and the Med is going by through the Malta Straits. There's also all kinds of connections to North Africa. So it's sort of this east, west, north, south axis and a, and a very valued security partner uh, for the U.S. And uh, I had mentioned, I said, hey, as we were overlooking the Grand Harbor, I said, you know, Constitution used to, you know, uh, do port calls here. And he knew that. He knew that some of the history of it. And uh, I said, you know, we should probably do some sort of marker um, and I, I seen the work of the Naval Order as a member. I'm a, I'm, I'm a life companion uh, of, the, of the Naval Order. Uh, they've been around since about 1890. Um, their uh, mission is to uh, record the history uh, of the, all of our sea services. Um, and they do that through not only through uh, memorials uh, and plaques and statues, but they also do it through lectures and uh, conferences and so forth. So um, I came back, spoke to some of the folks from the National Capital Commander here, um, and uh, they were certainly interested. Back in 2016, uh, we, we had placed a plaque at Port Mahan in Menorca, where the, the Mediterranean fleet had a very large uh, hospital and uh, sort of logistics base. Um, and that was done in conjunction uh, uh, with the Spanish government that it was presented there. Um, and then, uh, you know, so it was only natural that uh, we sort of uh, said, well, let's continue the, that something in that vein. So it, actually, this would have been uh, conceived of in about the spring of 2019. And in a short period of time, uh, we were able to uh, propose it, fundraise for it, um, and uh, have the plaque fabricated and it was dedicated in November of 2019. So that pretty was pretty quick turnaround. And, uh, and of course, uh, I had reached out to you during that uh, period um, to sort of confirm what I had already heard that the, the, that the Maltese sailors had served aboard her. So uh, basically, the, the, the plaque was uh, conceived of the of a, a, a memorialization of not only Constitution's service there, uh, as part during the the first Barbary War, but again the Maltese uh, sailors' service aboard her, uh, 
all delivered with the message that this was uh, part of the larger uh, protection of commerce and free trade uh, during that period. Um, we had a local uh, uh, architect uh, and a local company fabricate a beautiful piece of marble um, where we had the uh, uh, both in Maltese uh, and in uh, English uh, with the flags of both Malta and the United States as well as the symbol of the name lawyer. And the Maltese were very gracious uh, to allow us to place that in uh, what's called the Upper Baraka Garden, uh, which overlooks the Grand Harbor. It was a beautiful garden built during uh, the 19th century. Um, and uh, that uh, garden has multiple plaques commemorating uh, both internally uh, uh, great figures and events of Maltese history. There's also uh, a plaque there from the Honorable Artillery of Boston. Um, that commemorates the U.S. support to the siege of Malta in World War II. So it's sort of their play repository uh, for commemoration. We were greatly honored to have the opportunity to put it there. Um, uh, we de uh, dedicated, as I said, in November um, of that uh, of that year uh, of 2019, and it was uh, really a, a, a great event. Um, we had um, we had a, a, a reserve royal. Uh, Navy um, chaplain, uh, uh, Simon Godfrey, uh, Father Simon Godfrey, who is the, the canon of the, the Anglican Cathedral in Valletta. He spoke a little, uh, uh, he gave the invocation and spoke a bit. Um, uh, we had uh, the embassy represented at that point by the Chargé d'Affaires, uh, Mark Shapiro um, uh, spoke as well. And a lot of people don't realize that um, the connections even beyond the, the the history we were commemorating go even back to the revolution, because um, at that time, uh, the of course you had the sovereign order, military order of Malta that was in charge of the island, had a very powerful navy, mostly of galleys that uh, were sort of the security guarantors of the Med. Um, they also served the actual knights, uh, also served extensively in the French navy. And most famously, Admiral uh, uh, de Grasse uh, was the, who, of course, uh, led the uh, French naval forces in support of uh, Rochambeau and the French effort in, 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 the, in America. Um, most famously at the, at the Battle of the Virginia Capes, where um, basically he prevented the British from relieving the siege at Yorktown. Um, he was a member of the, uh, of the Knights of Malta and um, a great many of the officers, uh, estimates are in this, in, I think I've seen estimates as high as seven or 8,000 um, members of the, the French Navy, not only officers, but some of the ratings as well, would have been uh, either the Knights of, of, Knights of the Sovereign Order or would have been uh, Malte, of Maltese origin. So there is that connection going back even then. Um, that uh, I don't think a lot of people know about that. Uh, I don't think a lot of people are familiar with the uh, with the, the content of the officer corps of the French Navy at that time. Certainly not in the United States, but in Malta, what was your sense of how familiar the Maltese were with with this particular aspect of of America's naval history and its involvement in Malta? Well, I, I think I think there were, there was a lot of um, uh, I think that. They, they have a long understanding that they had many different elements come through the island, uh, whether it be the British, uh, you know, or the, uh, the sovereign order. Um, and, uh, and the French, of course, had a brief stint there. And I think um, there is definitely a cooperative feeling. And, uh, and that's why I mentioned that we had sort of, you know, a, a Royal Navy chaplain. We had uh, representatives of the armed forces of Malta and the Maltese government. Um, we had uh, members of the other uh, uh, attaché communities uh, in the, that, that served there. Um, and there's a, there's a very large, uh, for example, a very large uh, Italian uh, military advisory group there uh, that oversee a lot of uh, uh, training and assistance to Malta. And I think there is still that sort of cooperative feeling um, that, uh, that was true then, and, and you might even say and it's definitely uh, true now. Yeah. 
Uh, in addition to her role in Malta, USS Constitution, and the other American ships in the Mediterranean squadron were a regular presence in a couple other Italian ports. Uh, and again, now the Naval Order uh, may be pursuing the opportunity to similarly memorialize uh, the role of uh, both Constitution and the other Navy ships in those ports. Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that uh, set the, say, paradigm for this uh this effort was this cooperation between the defense attache office and the naval order. And, uh, you know, this was all volunteer work and uh, something that was mutually beneficial for all the groups involved. And uh, given that we have that model, in this case, my, um, my direct counterpart on the island was our Coast Guard attache, uh, Commander uh, Tim Burnett. And uh, he was the one who, you know, actually would, you know, make sure, you know, he would, uh, was dealing with the fabricator on the island and uh, and uh, letting us know, you know, what sort of permits were required and things like that. So that paradigm, I think, is a, a very effective one. Um, I was just recently in Malta uh, uh, on duties uh, and discussed it with the, there's a new uh, Coast Guard attache there, Tim Castle, uh, and uh, who's just arrived and uh, he uh, is looking uh, at potentially being cross accredited to uh, the defense attache office in Rome. So I discussed uh, with him if he'd be interested in supporting uh, an effort to put uh, an additional marker, um, in this case in Syracuse, which of course was, was a long um, used as a base for the Mediterranean squadron, including of course Constitution. And uh, you had mentioned and some other people had mentioned as well that Livorno um, uh, which uh, known at that time in, to, in the English speaking world was Leghorn, uh, was uh, another uh, major base. So we're pursuing um, the notion of putting similar markers uh, in those locations as well. And that's something that we're looking to sort of organize within the, within the, the next coming year. That's awesome. Um, very briefly, uh, can you sort of, you've mentioned the background of the Naval Order, but you are serving as a defense attache uh, through the Defense Intelligence Agency. Can you briefly describe what those are and, and what your role is there? I work, I, I'm, a, I'm a staff officer at headquarters uh, supporting uh, the efforts of the, of the offices uh, overseas. But the, uh, the actual attaches serving, uh, which they serve, uh, the, the offices are contained within our embassy teams overseas. Um, they serve as our military to military uh, uh, experts, uh, diplomats, you might say, military diplomats. And so, you know, uh, some of the larger uh, embassies and defense attache offices have, you know, there's an Air Force attache, an Army attache, some Marines, all the services represented. And they basically form those relationships um, with their counterparts in the countries they serve. And uh, in that case, they are, uh, you know, uh, establishing uh, the, whether it be training, exercises, all those, all those functions um, that, that you would imagine that uh, we deal with, uh, you know, in a military to military basis. Awesome. Mike, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you.